in the early 1900s in the fields of psychology, psychiatry, there was this sense that, you know, relationships were just a means to an end. The baby loved the mom because the mom gave the baby milk. The, 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 the husband loved the wife because the wife gave him sex. And, you know, the, the very sort of kind of transactional nature to it. Uh, one of my kind of academic heroes is this guy named John Bowlby, who was a psychiatrist, a British psychiatrist, and who really kind of gave rise to this, this attachment theory. And he worked with, uh, he worked on not only people who studied humans, but people who studied animals. And he recognized, you know, even in animals, relationships were not just a means to an end, that, that, that animals would engage in behaviors to strengthen relationships just for the purposes of strengthening relationships. And, and the way that he characterized this is it, 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 the root of this comes from the parent-child attachment, right? When our, our, and our offspring are probably the most extreme example of this, is that they are extremely helpless when they are born. So everything a human baby does, you know, cry, coo, uh, smile, is meant to draw the parent to the child. And that, you know, Bowlby reason was adaptive. And, you know, it had to be like that because the infant was so helpless. You know, those who study infant development sometimes refer to the first, say, three to six months of life as the fourth trimester because our babies are born half-baked. And so, you know, conversely, the, hum the, the parent had to develop this deep kind of love and attachment towards the child. It's not just a one-way street here. You know, certainly the, the child looks out for, you know, the parent's, uh, watchful care, but the parent, you know, anyone who's been a parent, you're looking at your three-year-old, making sure they're not running in the street, that sort of thing. There's this, there's this kind of like, they're a small attachment of you. And there's a, there's kind of an evolutionary link to that, right? That, that some becomes somewhat obvious that the that strongest form of attachment and love and altruism and so forth comes from the way that, you know, the way that nature shaped our our family relationships. Something I think is really interesting about that is that it's kind of inevitably linked with, with the challenge that is, right? If, if you ask a parent, you know, what is the most challenging thing you've done? Nine times out of 10, they'll say, raise my kid. If you say, okay, what's the most rewarding thing you've done? They'll say nine times out of 10, raise my kid, right? You, and you can't, you can't sign a, kind of get away from those. Let me, let me just, if it's all right, drive this point home with this, a kind of kooky thought experiment. W imagine what our social lives would be like if we were, say, seahorses, okay? So seahorses are different. In the, they, they have male pregnancy, which would probably automatically lead to some very different parental leave policies. But it, it, also the ways they're different is that they have like 2,000 babies at once. Part of that that's different is that they don't have any investment in their kids once they're born. It's kind of like, okay, they leave the male womb and goodbye, good luck, you know, hope you don't get eaten. Um, please make me proud. You know, no, no human being knows exactly what it's like to be a seahorse, but it's a good bet that they don't really care, have the same deep love and concern for their, their children, their offspring that, that human parents do. And so kind of at this confluence of, of psychology and evolution, there, you know, this, this, there can't be this deep love without compelling sacrifice. It's almost like a, a cosmic near spiritual truth. Does that make sense? Yeah, and there's another aspect to that as well. And Sam, perhaps you uh, could cite the study. I, we've talked about it on this show, but there is a, a certain level of happiness that we're all able to achieve, and that's going to go up and down as things change and we get older and there's going to be those hurdles. But those who do have children have much higher uh, ends of happiness due to having that relationship but their overall quality of life isn't as high in happiness as the, the person without the child. And I, I laugh about this because, of course, when I was younger, I never thought about having children. And now that I'm, I'm older and there's certain aspects of that that I, I do wish that I would get to experience and, and perhaps I will. But, you, you know, but that, that shows exactly of that attachment and what that delivers in us in our quality of life yeah there, i mean there's a lot of studies about this and, and i think this is where it's kind of really important to try to parse out our terms right we use these things like happiness well-being um you know good emotion right so parenting is not like if, if you think of happiness as like reading a book on the beach <laughs> 
That that's not parenting. I, <laughs> that I, I have yeah. I, I have five children that are fourteen and under. You know, so I you know it's it's a busy life. Um, it's but you know when you use terms like rewarding, that you know that seems to kind of uh, really get to this this matter more. There's a a great book. Uh, it was written by a woman named Jennifer Senior, 2014 or so, and I really like the title. It said. Um, all joy and no fun, the paradox of modern parenting. And, and the only qualm I have with that is the word modern, because as I've kind of laid out here, it's always been a challenge. It's kind of like evolutionarily written into our natures that raising children is going to take uh, a lot of sacrifice and effort. 